Welcome to another Quanta Intelligence podcast. All right, ready to dive in. Absolutely, let's do it. Today, we're tackling a musical chameleon, Jason Miles. Grammy Award winner. Right. But you know what's really wild? This is the same guy who produced those infectious 80s pop hits, and D worked with Miles Davis. Talk about range. It's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? You think you've got him pegged, and then bam, he's off collaborating with a jazz legend. And that's Jason's story, in a nutshell, anything but predictable. And thankfully, he's opened up about it all in his autobiography. Mm -hmm. We're talking the real inside scoop from those early days in Brooklyn to rubbing shoulders with music icons. And that's what I love about deep dives like this, going beyond the highlight reel, you know? Like, yeah, everyone knows the hits, but how did this kid obsessed with a wedding drummer in Brooklyn end up shaping the sound of jazz? Exactly. So let's rewind, shall we? Yeah. It's 1960s Brooklyn. Think egg creams, stickball. The Dodgers, yeah. But here's the thing. This is also a time when TV wasn't a 24-7 thing. Oh, right. Like you had, what, three channels? Maybe four if the antenna was feeling cooperative. So you really paid attention to what was on. You couldn't just endlessly scroll for something new. And Jason talks about the show Dial M for Music and how it was like this portal into jazz, especially the Hammond organ. It wasn't just background noise. It was formative. It makes you think about how we consume media today. It's almost too easy to have that next, next, next mentality, never really connecting with something on that deeper level. 100%. And that focus, that deep dive into music, it becomes a recurring theme in Jason's journey. Oh, totally. Like, even in his teenage years, every young musician goes through that, what instrument do I want yeah. phase. Right. But we're not talking garage bands here. Hmm. Jason lands gigs playing these massive organs. Borscht Belt Hotels. Can you imagine, as a teenager, talk about a crash course in entertainment? Right. It wasn't just about hitting the right notes. It was about reading the room, adapting to different crowds. Learning the art of performance. Those gigs were like boot camp. And then from those stages, he heads off to college in Indiana. Talk about a culture shock. Right. Brooklyn to Indiana. That'll light a fire under you to become independent, figure things out on your own, which, spoiler alert, becomes crucial once he hits the music industry. So picture this. Jason, fresh out of college, armed with his Indiana education and that Borscht Belt hustle. Ready to take on the world, right? And what a world it is. We're talking about the music industry in the early 80s, a scene exploding with talent, ambition. And cutthroat competition. Let's be real, it wasn't easy to stand out. So how does a kid from Brooklyn, even one with Jason's drive, break into that scene? Well, it all starts, believe it or not, with a chance meeting at a sushi bar. Okay, I have to admit, when I first read about this sushi bar encounter in the book, I had this image in my head. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Casual, maybe a little awkward California rolls. Exactly. But oh boy, was I wrong. This wasn't just any sushi date. This was a brush with greatness. Because sitting at that sushi bar was none other than Michael Brecker. The Michael Brecker. Legendary saxophonist, musical icon. The kind of musician other musicians idolized. And for Jason, still relatively unknown at this point, this wasn't just fanboying over a hero. This was a game changer. Because Brecker didn't just offer a polite keep at it. He became a mentor, a champion for Jason's work. Imagine that. A heavyweight like Michael Brecker telling everyone, this Jason Miles guy, he's the real deal. Talk about an endorsement. Chores. They swung wide open. Suddenly we're talking about studios with Marcus Miller, Luther Vandross, David Sanborn. And Jason doesn't just drop names, he pulls back the curtain, gives us those behind-the-scenes anecdotes that make it real. Like the Jamaica Boy sessions. Those guys could put away some chicken wings. Apparently, their food bill rivaled the studio time. That's dedication for you, though I'd have loved to see the expense reports. Then you've got the diva demands. And let's be honest, no music industry deep dive is complete without at least one. And trust me, Jason delivers. The Luther Vandross air conditioner story. Oh. Classic. Okay, you have to tell us. Picture this. It's the middle of summer, sweltering hot, everyone's sweating in the studio, and Luther walks in wearing a full-length fur coat. Hey, seriously, a fur coat in the summer. Dead serious. Turns out Luther was incredibly sensitive to air conditioning. Couldn't stand it. So they worked out this whole system, blast the AC to cool the studio down. Then right before Luther walked in, shut it all off. Talk about high stakes choreography. That <laughs> poor assistant. Right. But then you've got David Sanborn, the master of the alto sax, and his never ending quest for the perfect horn. Really? I never thought about it, but I guess at that level, every tiny difference matters. 
Absolutely. Jason said Sanborn would have saxophones flown in from all over, searching for that one in a million sound. It could be maddening for everyone else, but it's that dedication to the craft, you know. That pursuit of excellence. But speaking of excellence, we can't talk about Jason Miles without talking about Miles Davis. Right. This is the collaboration that puts Jason in the music history books. And yet the way he writes about meeting Miles is surprisingly understated. It's like he was almost afraid to geek out about it in the book. You know? Right. Like, oh, yeah, just met Miles Davis Tuesday. Totally. And I get it. Miles Davis, the man's a legend, an enigma. Intimidating even. But then Jason mentions this small moment, this tiny interaction that just speaks volumes. Miles looks at him and says, I like your name. I like your name. That's all it took. You'd think it wouldn't mean much, right? But coming from Miles, it was everything. It was that nod, that quiet seal of approval, like you're in. And next thing you know, they're changing the sound of jazz with Tutu. Talk about groundbreaking. I mean, think about it, Miles Davis. Known for that smooth, cool jazz sound. Exactly. And suddenly they're incorporating car crashes into the mix. Hold on, car crashes? Are we being punked? No way. They were using samples, industrial sounds, all this new tech. It was unheard of at the time, especially in jazz. Wow, Miles was more open-minded than I gave him credit for. Absolutely. But, you know, that's Jason for you. <laughs> Pushing boundaries, not afraid to experiment. But going back to the book, I love how he humanizes Miles. Yeah, he tells that story about the sweater. Right. Miles compliments Jason on this sweater, even offers to take him shopping. It's a small thing, but it reveals this warmth, this genuine human connection. Reminds you that even legends are just people, right? Totally. Though Jason doesn't shy away from the tougher stuff either. When Miles' health declines, you can feel that sense of loss, of sadness in his words. Yeah, it adds this whole other layer to their relationship. Mm -hmm. But it'd be easy to think that working with Miles Davis was the peak, Wait, right? Like, where do you go from there? But Jason's career, it takes all these unexpected twists and turns. Jingles, film scores. He even had a brush with Bruce Springsteen during those years. Seriously. Come on, you can't just drop a Springsteen name and not elaborate. Honestly, it's more of a you had to be there kind of story. But it illustrates how Jason could navigate these different worlds. One minute it's Miles Davis, the next it's the boss. He had this knack for connecting with people, you know. Totally. Like he could speak a dozen musical languages. Exactly. But even with all the collaboration, he had his own sound he was chasing, his own passions. The Ivan Lins Project. That's the one. Remember that cassette tape Miles gave him? Full of Brazilian music. Yeah, he was obsessed. Knew he had to do something with it. And he did. But it wasn't easy. Years of work, rejections from labels who just didn't get it. And yet, he persists. Brings in Sting, Vanessa Williams, Chaka Khan. Wins a Grammy. Talk about proving the doubters wrong. Seriously, if that's not inspiration, I don't know what is. But it wasn't always smooth sailing. Even for Jason. Yeah, he's pretty honest about the challenges of collaboration, like with global noise. That's the DJ Logic project, right? Yeah, and it's a good reminder that even when you've got incredible talent in the room, it doesn't always gel. Shared vision, being on the same page creatively, that's crucial. And sometimes, no matter how much you want it to work, you just have to walk away. The Ingrid Jensen collaboration is a perfect example of that. Mm. Incredible trumpet player, but creatively, they were speaking different languages. And that's okay. Sometimes recognizing when to move on is just as important as knowing when to stick with it. 100%. And you know, it's like all those experiences, all those collaborations, they brought Jason full circle to leading with his own sound, his own vision with Jason Miles kind of new. Which is funny because the inspiration for that came from seeing Herbie Hancock live. Talk about full circle, another jazz legend. What's amazing is Jason had already achieved so much at that point. Grammys, collaborations with some of the biggest names in music. But he still let himself be inspired, be challenged to push his own boundaries. And that's what I take away from Jason's story. It's not just about the accolades, the name dropping, the, there's plenty of that. It's that constant evolution, that hunger to keep learning and growing as an artist. And on that note, I'm curious, what resonates with you from Jason's journey? What inspires you to keep pushing your own creative boundaries? Because whether you're into jazz, pop, or anything in between, there's a universal truth in Jason's story. That creative path, it's rarely a straight line. And that's okay. In fact, that's where the magic happens. So keep exploring, keep experimenting, and who knows, maybe we'll be doing a deep dive on your story someday. Thank you for tuning in to Quanta Intelligence, the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe to stay updated on the latest in AI, business, and technology.
See you next time.